dry ice, cold enough to hurt your skin, and it makes this kind of fog when it's wet or in humid air. Now it's useful for keeping food cold and a lot of other things. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and this is Catalyst, shaping the future. Now, Dry ice is carbon dioxide, and it's really not good to release large amounts of it into our atmosphere. You can't see it, but your car is pumping out about a pound of this for every mile you drive, a pound a mile. Well, now some innovative scientists are engineering a way to pull carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere. This YouTube edition of Catalyst is brought to you by Arizona PBS and Arizona State University. Life has problems. Science turns them into questions that can lead to solutions and even innovations. Welcome to Catalyst, shaping the future through science research at Arizona State University. I think what's important for people to understand is that CO2 is a gas, even though you can't see it and you can't smell it, it has mass and, and it's a real thing. CO2, until now at least, we feel we can just dump it into the atmosphere and ignore it afterwards. We have to think of it as a waste management problem and actually clean up after ourselves. When I started to get involved in how do we manage carbon, it struck me that we really need to find a technology to pull CO2 back out of the environment and wouldn't be neat if we could get it back out of the air. The big idea behind this engineering is, well, think of those expanding panels on this device as the leaves on an artificial tree. Like leaves, they can capture carbon dioxide from the air. We call it artificial trees for a reason, because it acts like a tree. It's passive. We are not having big pumps and blowers which make things work. We just stand in the wind and pick things up. This stainless steel construction is a collection of panels that have a CO2 sorbent material that when it's dry, has a very strong affinity for carbon dioxide right from the air. And when it's made wet, just with water, it has a strong affinity to expel that CO2. And so you can take advantage of that phenomenon and put this material up in the air and let the air dry it and it will remove the CO2 from the air that goes through it. And then you collapse it into a sealed box and flood the box and make it wet. And then it will exhale all of the CO2 that it collected from the air. I'm pretty happy with this one. The last few weeks, we worked very hard on getting it built. Jason and Alan spent virtually every day here to make it happen. And this time, actually for the very first time for this device, we actually did it for real. And we watched in a little hidden CO2 monitor that the CO2 in the box indeed was rising. After a couple years of working on it, I can push buttons and things work as we expected them and firing it up for the first time, been big relief. This was a smashing success for the first try. Pulling carbon dioxide out of the air is a big accomplishment. But then, what do you do with that CO2? At the Polytechnic campus of Arizona State University, these ponds are growing algae. And like virtually all plants, algae will take in carbon dioxide and give off oxygen and water. But the negative carbon emissions team have to craft a way to feed the CO2 to the algae. You can count on the biology if you can figure out the plumbing. The large tower machine is, is the device that actually captures the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. That CO2 is concentrated in this machine here, which adds CO2 to a carbonate brine. That brine is then processed through this silver column over here, which produces the carbon dioxide gas, which we store in these three tanks. The high pressure tank, when it builds up the right pressure of CO2, will feed the CO2 gas through a meter here and it will come out through this plastic tube and it'll come over here to these algae ponds. But the CO2 that comes through this tube will enter into a membrane bundle that's submerged in this liquid. When the CO2 diffuses through that membrane into the water, the algae can utilize it directly and you don't lose any to the atmosphere. So we're providing the CO2 to feed these algae cultures from CO2 that we get from the atmosphere through that piece of machinery. People ask us why we are working so hard to get CO2 into an algae pond. And, and the answer is because algae has value. There are compounds that, that can be extracted from algae cultures that can be used not only in medicines, but also in cosmetics and other products that have high value. 
If I dump the garbage in front of your house, I of course have to pick up that garbage, right? But if you think about CO2, the garbage heap is actually the entire atmosphere and you can clean it up at every point. That in a way makes the problem actually easier. So our goal here is to do it, to build this machine. We know it works. We would like to get it out in public use where people can see that it works and we can show them why it works and how it works and how it can contribute to a climate solution in the future. Does driving to work feel like drudgery to you? Does it ever feel dangerous? The day we start traveling in driverless vehicles is just about here. Experts say fewer human drivers should mean fewer crashes. But even the testing to make driverless cars work has proven to be dangerous. An Arizona woman lost her life when an Uber test car struck her as she walked across a dark roadway. People who design robots make them to do jobs that humans consider dull, dirty, or dangerous. One of the next big challenges for robots and robotic systems will be getting those robots to do those jobs safely as a team. As you can see, they're all avoiding each other, which is what we want them to do. This is the Autonomous Collective Systems Laboratory at ASU. Engineers are programming these robots to work in teams. A lot of the swarm systems we see in nature, like we can tell that they, they do learn. As small as an ant is, it can figure out what to do. So when we design swarms of robots, we're looking at the same types of tasks that are dull, dangerous, and dirty, but on very large spatial and time scales. These are systems that are comprised of hundreds or thousands of individual robots that are each fairly limited in their capabilities and therefore pretty inexpensive, but collectively they can accomplish um, a variety of complex tasks. Rather than start from square one, the scientists turn to Mother Nature for inspiration. Swarming insects follow patterns the scientists are hoping to mimic. There's no, nobody in charge, no well-informed you know, uh, leader of the, of, the, of the bees or ants who collates information and then gives instructions. And yet even without that, in this totally decentralized way, uh, the colony is able to cooperate to do very complex group level tasks. They explore a large area, they find all the possible food sources there, and then they allocate their foraging force according to the quality of those food sources. So if the food is too large and bulky for a single ant to bring back, they will actually assemble a team. We've been looking at that specific behavior as a template for multi-robot cooperative manipulation. So we can think of analogous problems where a robot team would be required to assemble around a large payload. Um, it could be in manufacturing or construction or some unstructured environment like you would find after a disaster. And so the robots have to go in and cooperatively manipulate this object around obstacles over different types of terrain back to some location. So Steven's group takes video data of these ants and we have looked at this data. Here's the number of ants on this side of the load, here's the number on this side, this is what they're doing. And we've built mathematical models that describe the behavior of this system over time. Imagine a continuum of robots or a density field of robots and we're describing how that density field evolves over space and time. If we want a swarm of robotic bees to pollinate a crop field, we would want to specify that we want a certain density of coverage activity by the robots. Our hope is that we can design a system that's as robust and effective as a team of collectively transporting ants. The smaller robots are nicknamed phenos, short for phenotype. That's a biological term for the observable traits in an organism. The small robots are adaptable. They can be changed to use different sensors and tools. One of my most memorable experiences in, in robotics has been when Fino, the robot, first uh, turned on and started working correctly because it was designed in-house. It was designed to emulate a robot that was uh, $3,500 plus, and we did it for three to $300, $350. They can see about 15 centimeters, that's around six inch ahead of them. So they can, like this robot can see this line over here. So that, that's the starting line of sight and they can see till infinity. 
the Fino is able to look at the purple tape and know that it's a boundary and pretend that it's like a wall. So that is what we primarily use for Finos to be able to tell where to stop and where to turn. The little IR sensors that we add to the Fino, they're able to actually, once another Fino gets too close, they're able to repel one another and move away from one another so they don't run into each other. Toy drones are an affordable way to experiment with autonomous flying robots. The engineers want the drones to navigate and land all by themselves. You can see the photo taking off, then flying ahead, and then hovering or landing after some point of time. The goal of the experiment was to have them build a map of the environment. So that's what I'm trying to use the Intel drones that we have, so that to see it is possible to build a map using two flying robots. Second question would be, can they do it by themselves without having a central computer to do it? As humans, we use a lot of body language to gauge each other's expressions. Can we have a similar kind of strategy for robots to gauge each other's interactions? If you think about one or two robots, it, it doesn't matter how much is the communication bandwidth. But when you start talking about ten or hundreds or thousands of robots, it makes a lot of difference. The lesser the communication bandwidth you're using, the more autonomous you can get them to be. Improving communication between autonomous vehicles and the transportation infrastructure, like stoplights, will help make traffic more efficient. Programmers want the vehicles to read traffic signals and hopefully avoid collisions. Currently, these robots are, are being used to study the interactions between smart infrastructure and autonomous vehicles. Both are things that are coming to our cities in the future. They've already started. Smart infrastructure will be able to keep track of what the cars around it are doing, as well as to tell them to correct their course when necessary. Just like how we know stop lights and stop signs, and we communicate with them with light. Our eyes see red, green, but autonomous vehicles, they will communicate wirelessly. So it, it's not going to hit it, but it's going to divert from it. It's exactly emulating how humans drive. They are following the road. They're obeying speed limits, which we pre-program. And when they get to a stoplight, they stop or go, depending on what the stoplight tells them. So we're trying to see what is the point of diminishing returns between increasing infrastructure capability and collisions. If you're going to implement smart infrastructures, it's going to be expensive, but how much capability should you invest in, can you invest in, before you start getting no more real diminishing in, in the collisions? When comparing these robots to, for example, um, like Ubers or the, the Waymo vehicles or any of the other big autonomous research projects from car makers, we cannot do some things they can. For example, they have pieces of equipment that individually each piece on this vehicle costs $70,000. But what we can do is that we can study things as a whole system. We can have collisions, we can quickly change basically anything about the system, whereas the big research projects like Uber, they don't have a whole city. Collisions are not okay. Everything carries a lot of risks for them. Everything carries tens of thousands of dollars, at least in damages. Our robot is actually open source and open hardware. Anyone can go online to our lab and just download it and make one on their own. We have guides for people to learn, especially for kids and enthusiasts and educators who want to teach robotics to students. This is why we made the platform also to give out to the community. We hear the word virus and right away we think illness, a cold, the flu. Hi everyone, I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz and this is Catalyst, shaping the future. Now, for most of us, cancer would be far worse than getting a cold or the flu. But picture this, using science to turn a killer virus into a life-saving weapon to fight cancer. Just imagine the doctor telling you you have a, a cancer for which there's no cure and the natural survival rate, the average survival rate, is five years. That news was devastating for Andy Gordon. I started to feel some pains and I felt like I'd pulled a muscle or something in the chest. I'm a pretty active cyclist and thought, athletic injury, middle-aged guy overdoing it. He was fit, healthy, and active. His diagnosis, multiple myeloma, a cancer of the blood, a diagnosis both surprising and haunting for him. He says it'll take more tests to know for sure, but we think you have a form of blood cancer known as multiple myeloma. Do you know what that is? 
and I looked at him and I said, oh my God, my first wife died of multiple myeloma 12 years before. I've had the privilege of taking care of Andy, really going back to his diagnosis uh, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and his treatment was fairly standard at the time. He underwent what's called a stem cell transplant, where we give him a very high dose of chemotherapy, but because that chemotherapy would wipe out all of his bone marrow, immediately before we give him that chemotherapy, we collect stem cells from his bone marrow that can grow a new one. So it's kind of like burning the lawn to get rid of the weeds. We burnt the lawn, but we made sure before we collected seeds to grow a new lawn. What the stem cell transplant does for you is it puts you into complete remission. You, there's no detectable cancer in your body, but sort of emphasis on the word detectable, it is there somewhere, and at some point uh, it will recur. And I said, so Joe, when this comes back, and we know it will, what happens next? And he says, well, you're not gonna have another transplant. And I kind of, whoa, what's that mean? And he says, well, transplants will be so yesterday by that point. Looking to his future, I'm very confident that we'll be able to use the newer approaches and the newer treatments that we're now engaged with. We also are developing all sorts of new molecules and new approaches where we can attack the disease from different ways. And even if we can't cure it, we can control it in the longer term. At the leading edge of the search for cures to myeloma is work going on here inside the Biodesign Institute at Arizona State University. Oncolytic virotherapy is the use of a live virus that is harmless for humans uh, by itself, but has the capacity to replicate in tumor tissues and affect and kill tumor tissues, but not hurt the host. Here's the big idea. Could a virus that is devastating to rabbits be tricked into becoming a potential lifesaver for humans? I wanted to study a virus that had an effect out there in the world, but was basically harmless for people. So I ended up picking a rabbit virus that Australians used more than 70 years ago to try and kill feral European rabbits that had gone crazy in Australia. The name of that virus, Myxoma. The lethal dose it takes to kill 100% of the animals is a single infectious unit, which means that if you're a rabbit, as soon as any cell on any surface of, the, of your body is infected with this virus, you die with 99.9% .9 certainty within two weeks after the infection. You can think of it as the zombie apocalypse for rabbits, but it's harmless for mice, humans, and every other vertebrate organism we know about. But one of the things we stumbled upon is that the virus can sometimes replicate in certain human cancer cells. In other words, the cancer cells had lost their ability to defend themselves against this kind of virus. So this kind of got us into the question, can we use the virus as a live drug to treat recipients that have got cancer if the virus is harmless for the host, but dangerous for the actual cancer tissue? When we first realized that this virus would grow very well in human cancer cells, we were not a cancer lab at the time, and we went looking for collaborators to help us test whether or not we could use this virus to actually treat and cure cancers in a, in a test animal host that has cancer. McFadden connected with a researcher who was working with the brain tissue of mice. He said, why don't you give me some of your magic virus and we will inject it into mice implanted with human glioblastoma, which is one of the really horrible human cancers. So the virus, when it was injected into the glioblastoma in the brains of these mice, grew out through the tumor tissue, stopped growing when it hit normal brain tissue. The tumors started to die, and when all the tumors were gone in the mice, the virus vanished because it no longer had cells that it could grow in. So we were able to basically cure 100% of those mice, and at the time of sacrifice, all of the glioblastoma was gone from them. So here in Arizona, we've just started a new collaboration on multiple myeloma with the myeloma experts at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. One of the things we are exploring is can we add this virus to a bone marrow transplant and kill every last cancer cell in that patient's body at the time of transplant. Imagine a time when a virus, like the myxoma rabbit virus, could be the tool zeroed in on cancers like Andy Gordon's myeloma. Since I was diagnosed the first time, I have done more than 
10 or 12 hundred mile bike rides and, and competing, I'm still working full time. You can have a full life. I mean, you know, I'm gonna cry again. Uh -huh. I've seen the birth of both of our grandchildren. I'm watching them grow up. Uh, uh, that's the stuff to look forward to. And screw the cancer. Do you have a favorite sport? Maybe a favorite team? Well, one day, the most important team in your life may not be the one playing a ball game. It may be the team you're suddenly counting on in a visit to a hospital emergency room or a team of paramedics working to rescue you from a dangerous situation. And there's a lot of science behind making those teams perform better. Put the ball in the net. It's not complicated, but even soccer has rules and strategies of defense and offense. Runners, runners. And it's an international game. So pro players like these Phoenix Rising teammates may be speaking to each other in a language that is not the one they grew up speaking. I'm Sulemon Asante. I'm from Ghana. I'm a right winger. I was in Congo, DR. I was playing there. I was there for five years, and then the language was in French. And this time here around is English. So I'm trying to adapt with everything. Sometimes people speak in different languages. They're, they're saying the same words. You understand the word model, but you don't understand what they mean by it. Yeah, it's difficult sometimes. You know, we have new guys in that have to get used to you. When it's game time, communication becomes even more important. We take a lot of measures of what we call team process. How did they interact? How did they communicate? How did they coordinate? And all of those things are relevant for trying to understand how to make teams better. Teams under pressure, communication, what works, what doesn't, and why. That's what Nancy Cook's research is all about. Cook measures the performance of a group by measuring how effective it is at achieving its goals. Cook works in human systems engineering at the Polytechnic School at Arizona State University. Mm -hmm. Many of her findings come out of this lab, and then they make their way into real world situations, like the stress on medical and emergency response teams. Situations where the stakes are much higher than just a soccer game. In this scenario, it's a confined space rescue. Victims trapped below street level and possibly exposed to poisonous fumes. Emergency events are, are incredibly complex and very high risk and dangerous. So communication is, the, uh, is a critical component to their um, ability to accomplish the mission or to effect a rescue or to recover a body or to secure a hazardous environment. You've got teams from every corner of the valley that can come together on one of these events. So their ability to work interoperable with one another is incredibly important. We're on scene of a vehicle into a trench. There's really an initial learning period that has to happen when any team assembles to try to figure out how to talk to one another. And some of the biggest problems teams like that can have are understanding who does what and communication. Pick the ones removed. Well, this is only training, but even here, first responders know that time counts. Real victims might be injured and even dying. And that can add pressure, conflict, and confusion to their communication. My research is on teams and has been teams of people. More recently, it's on teams of people and robots and artificial agents working together. In the future, tools like these may be controlled remotely and work robotically. The culture in the fire service is very hands-on, very tactile, uh, very much a blue-collar environment. So technology, when it creeps in, can feel like an affront to the way that we do business, right? It's an affront to our skill set. We like to think that we can get through stuff with the, with the tools that we have. Soon, it will get easier. As research underway at the Polytechnic School at Arizona State University pairs research teams with a popular computer game to simulate emergency rescue situations that will one day allow the first responder to send in a robot when there is danger. We're looking at human robot teaming where the robot is inside a collapsed building structure looking for victims and there's a human on the outside mapping where those victims are. 
what we're doing in our lab is putting two people together and it's a Minecraft environment. We use Minecraft to simulate the collapsed building. And we have one person that plays the role of what would be the robot inside the building, communicating with the person on the outside. And let's do the restrooms and the elevators. It's a challenging problem because the person on the outside might have a floor plan, but that floor plan has changed now that walls are down and doors are down. And so how does the robot on the inside communicate where the victims are to the person on the outside? A call came in, they found an unconscious victim outside. You have a group of uh, technical operators that are going down into a space and they're remote from the rest of the crews. So that's the communication there is really, really imperative. And so that stress complicates communication. We talk about how important it is. We talk about uh, ways to communicate with one another, to convey a message in a time sensitive manner or using concise language, things like that to help convey the intent of the command officer, or convey the intent of the communicator. And that's how you can tell the good teams from the bad. We look at how they respond. We look at their communication, their coordination, situation awareness. And the idea is that the research begins and ends in the field. We don't want to ask people to change to be more like robots or to interact better with robots. We want the robots to interact better with the people. The behavioral science that Nancy Cook can bring to situations like these may help ensure that when it's real life and life or death, nobody working on scene will be the dummy. I'm Professor Vanessa Ruiz, and what you've been seeing is Catalyst, our show about shaping the future, how research creates real life results, and because our lives always have new problems that science can help to solve, we'll be back soon with more stories. Catalyst is supported by Knowledge Enterprise Development at Arizona State University. Advancing entrepreneurship, innovation, discovery, and knowledge for the public good. Subscribe to this channel to see more episodes of Catalyst on YouTube.